Hi children, good morning. I hope everyone is doing great and we are just 5 days away from the final day that is NEET 2024 on the coming Sunday. Okay? Yes. So, in this NEET refresher classes yesterday we have discussed about the solutions partly and the remaining part of the solutions today we will be doing. Then, yesterday we have discussed about the ideal solutions, non-ideal solutions and the concentration methods. So, today we will be discussing about colligative properties. Yes. See children remember you know pretty well about the colligative properties. Vapor pressure, boiling point and freezing point are not colligative properties. The changes in them are the colligative properties. Whereas, osmotic pressure itself is a colligative property. This is the very, very important thing. So, osmotic pressure is a colligative property, but vapor pressure, boiling point, freezing points are not colligative properties. Lowering in vapor pressure, elevation in boiling point, depression in freezing point are the colligative properties, but osmotic pressure itself is a colligative property. This, this all the colligative properties are directly proportional to the concentration, are directly proportional to molarity into number of ions given by one molecule on ionization. That means, if ever we compare the two different electrolytes, then the solution that contains greater value of molarity into number of ions given by one molecule will have greater colligative properties. Then what is the greater colligative properties? Greater colligative properties means that solution will have the least vapor pressure, highest boiling point and least freezing point and highest osmotic pressure. Suppose A and B are the two solutions. A has greater colligative properties means vapor pressure of A is less than that of B. Boiling point of A is greater than that of B. Freezing point of A is less than that of B and osmotic pressure of A is greater than that of B. So, they are nothing but greater colligative properties. Do not get any confusion in this thing. Now, let us see the colligative properties. Now, here 1 molar urea and 0.5 molar urea means both are non-electrolytes, then greater the concentration, greater is the colligative properties. Means 1 molar urea has greater colligative properties. When it comes to this, 1 molar sodium chloride which is an electrolyte, 1 molar urea which is a non-electrolyte, when both electrolytes and non-electrolytes are compared, then for electrolytes we have to see molarity into number of ions, for non-electrolytes just concentration. So, 1 molar sodium chloride is equal to 1 into 2, 1 molar urea is equal to 1 into 1. So, that is the reason 1 molar sodium chloride will have greater colligative properties. That means, 1 molar sodium chloride will have lower vapor pressure, higher boiling point, lower freezing point and a higher osmotic pressure. Now, here in the case of third one, here all these are except glucose are ionic compounds. So, all are 1 molar concentrations. Now, here I am calculating like this 1 into 5 because each aluminum sulphate will give 5 ions. Then 1 into 4, 1 into 3, 1 barium 2 chlorides, 1 into 2, 1 into 1. See, these are the values of molarity into number of ions given by one molecule. So, among all these, which will have the greater colligative properties? One molar aluminum sulphate will have greater colligative properties. Is it clear? Then, now for some solutions, theoretical colligative properties differs from the observable colligative properties. That is because of the difference in this number of ions given by molecules on ionization. To equalize both theoretical and observed colligative properties, here we have introduced a term Van't Hoff's factor that is I. This Van't Hoff's factor will have greater than 1 value for uh, ionic compounds and is equal to 1 for covalent compounds if they do not undergo association. Is it clear? If they undergo association, that value may be less than 1. That means simply what we can say is, in the case of disassociation, I is equal to greater than 1. In the case of association, I is equal to less than 1. 
then this van der Hoff's factor is equal to now experimental lowering in vapor pressure by theoretical uh, lowering in vapor pressure similarly experimental colligative properties by divided by uh, theoretical colligative properties now here you see actual number of particles in the solution by number of particles taken suppose if i take uh, aluminum sulfate aluminum sulfate what could be the i value for aluminum sulfate if it undergoes 100% ionization that is aluminum sulfate will give two aluminum ions and three sulfate ions so that means each aluminum sulfate will give five ions so colligate that means van der Hoff's factor for aluminum sulfate is equal to five this van der Hoff's factor depends upon the concentration as the concentration of an electrolyte decreases if the concentration decreases ionization increases if the ionization increases this van der Hoff's factor also increases now here i'll give you one example 0.1 molar sodium chloride 0 0.01 molar sodium chloride 0 0.001 molar sodium chloride among those three the one that will have the higher uh, this uh, van der Hoff's factor is this why because among these three here the concentration is less if the concentration is less degree of ionization is more if the degree of ionization is more more number of ions are present in the solution that is the reason van der Hoff's factor in the case of uh, 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 different solutions of the same electrolyte the solution with a lower concentration of an electrolyte will have greater van der Hoff's factor is it clear children yes now in the case of disassociation or ionization in order to calculate this uh, uh, colligative properties we require i factor and this i factor depends upon the degree of disassociation or percentage of ionization then so this degree of ionization alpha is equal to i minus 1 by n minus 1 children remember actually two different formulas we can use for ionization and association here instead of that here let us discuss only one formula for both ionization as well as uh, uh, association as well as a disassociation so alpha is equal to i minus 1 by n minus 1 what is this alpha degree of disassociation or ionization i is a vantage factor what is n n is the number of particles given by one molecule uh, in the solution now i am taking like this barium chloride barium chloride will give one barium ion two chloride ions so n value for barium chloride will be three suppose if i take acetic acid in the benzene in the benzene acetic acid undergoes association two acetic acid molecules will give only one molecule one particle in the solution is it clear so when two are giving one one will give how much one by two so n is equal to one by two for the dimerization of this acetic acid suppose if you take trimerization trimerization means here i am taking 3a will give a3 so for this n is equal to 1 by 3 so same formula you can use for ionization as well as association that means a disassociation as well as association is it clear children yes now see if ever we see the different solutions this already we have discussed that means the molarity into number of ions given by one molecule will have the same colligative properties is it clear now here one more example also i have given three molar three molar sodium chloride that means three into two six into one two into three one point two into five that means all these solutions will have same lowering in vapor pressure same elevation in boiling point same depression in freezing point and the same increase in the osmotic pressure is it clear children then now what are isotonic solutions see isotonic solutions are nothing but solutions with same osmotic pressure so what is osmotic pressure that is pi we denote osmotic pressure with pi pi is equal to crt 
if ever we take the two solutions with the same osmotic pressure. So, what is the condition? Pi 1 is equal to pi 2, C 1, R T 1, C 2, R T 2. So, R is molar gas constant and T is the temperature, if they are same, then C 1 is equal to C 2, that means the concentration. So, C 1 is equal to C 2 means this is equal to N 1 is equal to N 2. What is the N 1 is equal to N 2? Number of moles of the first electrolyte is equal to first solute, solute is equal to number of moles of the second solute. That means W 1 by M 1 is equal to W 2 by M 2. Children, this is the very, very important. You may get the numerical like this. 5 percent glucose solution is isotonic with 3 percent solution of an unknown solute. Then find the molecular weight of solute. Here, what is the condition? Isotonic, they said. So, this is the condition for isotonic. W 1, that means 5 by molecular weight of glucose, 180. This is equal to W 2, that means 3 percent, 3 grams, divided by molecular weight of unknown solute. So, this is equal to how much? 5, that means 36 times, so 36 into 3. So, molecular weight is equal to 108. If ever you get a solution question like this, 5 percent glucose solution has the same lowering in vapor pressure as 3 percent solution of an unknown solute, then find the molecular weight of the solute. Again, you can use the same formula. Is it clear, children? Hmm? Now, now let us see one question here. This is the question. 62 grams of ethylene glycol solution has a freezing point of minus 9.3 degree centigrade. Generally, freezing point of water will be 0 degree centigrade. So, because of addition of this glycol, freezing point of water is decreased to minus 9.3. Then, when dissolved in the 250 grams of water, weight of water separating out as ice will be. Now, listen. See here, 250 grams of water we have taken in that we have dissolved 62 grams of ethylene glycol, clear? And some water gets separated as an ice. So, here what we have to calculate is how much of water is present in the solution we have to see. Once you know the how much of water is present in the solution, if that is subtracted from the total weight of the water, then you will be knowing the weight of the ice water that is separated as an ice. Then here it is related to freezing point. Now I am writing like this. Delta T f is equal to I k f into m. I is equal to Van Hoff's factor, here ethylene glycol, it is an organic, so it does not undergo either association or disassociation, I is equal to 1. Then what is the delta F here? Delta F is 0 minus of minus 9.3. So, depression in the freezing point will be 9.3. Kf, what is the Kf? Molal depression constant, that is 1.86 into molality. Molality is nothing but the weight of the solute. What is the weight of the solute? It is 62. Ethylene glycol CH2OH CH2OH. So, 12, 14, uh, 15, 31 into 2, 62. So, molecular weight of ethylene glycol is 62 into 1000 divided by weight of water. So, this is the weight of the water which is present in the solution in the liquid state. Is it clear? Now, this 62, 62 gets cancelled. If ever we simplify that, you will get a weight of water as 200 grams. That means, out of the 250 grams of water in which we have dissolved 62 grams of ethylene glycol, 200 grams will be present in the liquid form. Then how much of water is separated as an ice? That is 250 minus 200 is equal to 50 grams. So, 50 grams of ice gets separated. Is it clear children? Yes. Now, let us proceed to the next. Osmotic pressure of 50 percent ionized 0 0.01 molar. 
ஃபிஃப்டி பர்சன்ட் அயனைஸ்டு பாயிண்ட் சாரி பாயிண்ட் ஒன் மோலார் சோடியம் சல்ஃபேட் சொல்யூஷன் எட் ஃபைவ் ஹண்ட்ரட் கே நாவ் ஆஸ்மாட்டிக் ப்ரெஷர் இஸ் ஈக்வல் டு ஐசிஆர்டி ஆஸ் இட் இஸ் எ சோடியம் சல்ஃபேட் இட் அண்டர் கோஸ் அயனைசேஷன் பிகாஸ் த ஐ வேல்யூ இஸ் குவாய்ட் சிக்னிஃபிகண்ட் இன் திஸ் தென் ஃபிஃப்டி பர்சன்ட் அயனைஸ்டு சப்போஸ் இஃப் திஸ் ஏ ஹண்ட்ரட் பர்சன்ட் அயனைஸ்டு ஐ இஸ் ஈக்வல் டு த்ரீ ஃபார் தட் then 50% percent ionized so we have to calculate alpha is equal to i minus 1 by n minus 1 how much is ionized 50% percent. so this is equal to 0.5 i minus 1 n what is the n value here sodium sulfate will give two sodium ions one sulfate that is 3 minus 1 so 3 minus 1 is equal to 2 2 into 0.5 that is equal to 1 then i is equal to 2 is it clear then now pi is equal to 2 into concentration what is the concentration 0.1 into r r is 0.0821 liter atmosphere then 500 kelvins this is atmosphere so children here the important point is calculating this i this is an important so if the if the problems if they don't mention the percentage of ionization we need to assume it as an 100% ionized then i is equal to number of ions given by one molecule suppose if they mention percentage so based on the percentage of ionization you have to calculate i and that i value we need to substitute in this is it clear now here you see Vant Hoff's factor for Hg2Cl2. Children here remember one thing. Hg2Cl2. Hg2 2 plus 2 Cl minus. Hg2Cl2. Hg plus 2 plus 2 Cl minus. So both mercurous chloride and mercury chloride will give same number of ions in the solution. Suppose if both of them are 100% ionized, then I is equal to 3 for Hg2Cl2 and 3 for HgCl2, it is the same. Then here we need to calculate this Van't Hoff factor and what is the percentage of ionized? 80% ionized. So, alpha is equal to, that is 0.8, I minus 1. What is the substance Hg2Cl2? That is 3 minus 1. So, this is equal to I minus 1 by 2. Then, I minus 1 is equal to 1.6. I is equal to 2.6. So, this is the 2.6. Is it clear? Next. Now, phenol dimerizes. See, till now we have discussed the problems pertaining to the electrolytes. That means, which undergone ionization. Whereas, this is undergoing association. And for association also, we are using the same formula. Then what is the Van't Hoff factor here? 0.54. So that is alpha is equal to I minus. So Van't Hoff factor there is 0.54 minus 1. Then N. See, phenol dimerizes. That means two molecules of the phenol get associated to give 1. So what is the N value here? n value will be 1 by 2 minus 1. So, this is equal to uh, minus 0.46 divided by minus 0.5. So, this is equal to 0.92. See, children remember, if ever they ask degree of uh, disassociation, degree of uh, association, if they ask degree of disassociation, it is per 1. If they ask a percentage of association, that multiplied with 100. Is it clear? Now, let us see this problem. Now, see this is an important problem. 0 0.004 molar solution of sodium sulphate is isotonic with 0 0.01 molar solution of glucose. That means two solutions they are comparing. So, that is equal to pi 1 is equal to pi 2. I 1 C 1 R T 1 I 2 C R T 2. Now, 
पॉइंट जीरो जीरो फोर मोलार सोल्यूशन ऑफ सोडियम सल्फेट इज आइसोटोनिक विद पॉइंट जीरो वन मोलार सोल्यूशन ऑफ ग्लूकोज इज द सेम टेम्परेचर द अपेरेंट डिग्री ऑफ डिसोसिएशन ऑफ सोडियम क्लोराइड इज क्लियर नाउ फर्स्ट वी नीड टू कैलकुलेट आई वन ऑफ दैट मीन सोडियम सल्फेट सी वन दैट इज हाउ मच पॉइंट जीरो जीरो फोर इंटू आर टी वन इज ईक्वल टू आई टू इज ईक्वल टू वन फॉर ग्लूकोज C. What is the concentration? Point zero one into R. Point zero one into R T two. R T one and R T two are same. So there, I one into point zero zero four is equal to point zero one. Then I one is equal to point zero one by point zero zero four. Is it clear? So here it will be into thousand. By hundred, so there is nothing but two point five. So what is the two point five? Two point five is the Van der Haaf's factor for sodium sulfate because it is not undergoing hundred percent ionization. So what they are asking? Apparent degree of disassociation. So alpha is equal to I minus one by n minus one. What is the I? They said two point five minus one. So what is the n for sodium sulfate? Three, three minus one. That is two point five minus one. That is one point five by two. That is equal to point seven five. Point seven five is the degree of disassociation or degree of ionization. If ever they ask a percentage of ionization, that is into hundred. That is equal to seventy five percent. Is it clear, children? Yes. Now, mole fraction of a toluene in the vapor. This is the one which you need to underline. See, this is the very very important thing, which is in equilibrium with a solution containing benzene and toluene, having two moles each. So, when the vapor pressure of pure benzene and toluene. Now, here, vapor pressure of there is a mole fraction of a component in the vapor phase. Generally, we can denote by y. So, for which they are asking, they are asking for toluene is equal to pressure of toluene divided by total pressure. So, what is the pressure of toluene here? P naught toluene into x toluene divided by P naught toluene. X toluene plus P naught benzene, X benzene. Is it clear? Now they are asking for only toluene. So Y toluene is equal to then P naught toluene. How much P naught toluene? See here benzene and toluene. Benzene will have one twenty and toluene will have eighty. So eighty into Mole fraction. Mole fraction is nothing but the number of moles of that component divided by total number of moles. Here, what they said, two moles each. That is two by two plus two divided by eighty into two by two plus two plus one twenty into two by two plus two. That is two uh, by four, one by two, forty divided by. Here it is forty plus. Sixty. So this is equal to forty by hundred. So that is equal to point four. So vapor pressure of toluene in the vapor form is vapor phase is point four. So children remember, see, are they asking in the vapor phase or are they are they asking in the solution? That is very very important. Solution generally we denote with the x. In the vapor we denote it with the y. Is it clear? Now, now let us see uh, chemical equilibrium. That you know pretty well. For a reaction at equilibrium, delta G is equal to zero. So this is the very very important one. See, there are two things. One is 
delta g, another is delta g naught. Both looks to be the looks to be the same, but delta g naught is nothing but the standard free energy change. Means it is only in the standard condition. Equilibrium can be obtained at any condition. Need not be in the standard condition because of that for a reaction at equilibrium delta g is equal to zero. Now, see, uh, this is the very very important one. Catalyst does not affect the position of equilibrium. Position of equilibrium will be affected by the concentration and the changes in the pressure, changes in the temperature, but catalyst will not affect the position of equilibrium. Either it speed up the attainment of equilibrium or it slows down the attainment of equilibrium. And one more important thing is law of mass action is applicable to chemical equilibria because law of mass action is related to the concentrations and the concentrations will change in the chemical reactions. So, law of mass action is applicable to chemical equilibria whereas, lee chartier principle is applicable to both physical as well as chemical changes that means, both physical as well as chemical equilibria. Next, active mass of a gas of any volume at STP. See, active masses of solid components need to be taken as a one. Even the gaseous component of any volume at STP need to be taken as a one by 22.4 because active mass is equal to uh, number of moles by volume. Suppose if ever I ask you the question like this, what is the active mass of 5.6 liters of nitrogen at STP. So, 5.6 liters of nitrogen at STP means 5.6 divided by 22.4. There is a number of moles of nitrogen. Then what is the volume? Volume is 5.6 liters. So, this is the 5.6, this is the 5.6 because in the case of gases, volume of a gas is nothing but the volume of the container. So, these two gets cancelled, then what is the left over? 1 by 22.4. So, active mass of any gas of any volume under the standard conditions is equal to always 1 by 22.4. Next, see the ratio of the concentration of products to reactants. See, I am taking like this A giving rise to B. Now, Q C is equal to concentration of B by concentration of A means ratio of the concentration of product to that of reactants. In a system, in a system at any condition need not be equilibrium remember at any condition is called reaction quotient. So, a reaction quotient will have the different values for the same reaction under different conditions. Clear? Then, if you take these values at equilibrium, at equilibrium, then it is called Kc that means the equilibrium constant. So, Qc is nothing but the ratio of the concentration of products divided to that of reactants at any stage of the reaction. Kc is only at equilibrium. So, for a given reaction at a given temperature, the value of Kc will be only 1, not a numerical 1, it will have 1 value, clear. But for a reaction, for a reaction at a given temperature, Qc will have the different different values. Clear? Then, so a reaction will have the several Qc values, but one Kc value at a given temperature. So, the, the, by using this Qc Kc values, we can predict in which direction reaction proceeds. So, here what you need to remember is all the reversible reactions will proceed in a direction in which Qc value becomes equal to Kc. That means, for a reaction, Qc is equal to 3. Kc is equal to 2, let us assume. That means, the Qc value is more. So, what should happen? That means, the reaction should proceed in a direction in which Qc value should decrease. So, Qc value should decrease means what? Concentration of products should decrease. So, concentration of reactants should increase. So, concentration of products should decrease. Concentration of reactants should increase means which reaction should favor? Backward reaction should favor. If the backward reaction favors, the equilibrium will shift towards left side. Suppose, if Qc is equal to 4, Kc is equal to 2. So, that means, sorry, uh, Qc is equal to 1, Kc is equal to 2. 2. 
so there what should happen that means as the equilibrium constant is greater than the uh, reaction quotient reaction quotient value should increase so reaction quotient value should increase means concentration of product should increase concentration of reactant should decrease in which reaction it will happen for the reaction so equilibrium will be shifting towards right side or towards product side is it clear so based on the qc and kc value we can predict in which direction equilibrium will move is it clear then See addition of inert gas, addition of inert gas. Take for example, A giving rise to 2B. This is gas, it is also gas. Now, here A and B are the reactants and products of that reaction. Here I am adding uh, some X. X neither reacts with A nor reacts with B. So, here we can call X as an inert gas. Clear? then when addition of inert gas to a system yet a constant volume at a constant volume means in a closed container when a reaction is performed in a closed container if you add inert gas to that system then that system that means in that system equilibrium neither moves towards left side nor moves towards right side that means addition of inert gas has no effect on the position of equilibrium if the reaction is performed in the closed containers or at constant volume. If ever you add the inert gas to a system at a constant pressure, constant pressure means open vessel, open vessel, then position of equilibrium will be affected. How that is? You take for example, this is the reaction uh, vessel, this is the piston and here I am performing this reaction A giving rise to 2B. If ever we add some inert gas to the system, that inert gas will make the piston to move upwards. So, volume increases, naturally pressure decreases. If the pressure decreases, in which direction equilibrium will move? Equilibrium will move in the direction of increase in volume or increase in number of moles. So, in which direction increase in number of moles is happening? In the forward direction. So, to this reaction, yet a constant pressure, if inert gas is added, equilibrium will move towards right side or in another way. Or I will give one more example. 2SO2 plus O2 giving rise to 2SO3. How many moles of the reactants? 3 moles. How many moles of the products? 2 moles. If ever I perform this reaction at constant volume, now I am adding some helium gas to this. That means there is a real inert gas. Then as I am performing the reaction at constant pressure, equilibrium neither moves towards right side nor moves towards left side. If ever I add inert gas to the system at a constant pressure, so addition of inert gas to a system at a constant pressure and decrease in pressure will have the same effect on the position of equilibrium. If the pressure decreases, then equilibrium will move in the direction of increase in volume or increase in number of moles. That means 2 moles should become 3 moles. So, which reaction will be favored? Means a backward reaction will be favored. Is it clear children? Right. Then, see if the concentrations of reactants and products which are, which are not present in the equilibrium expression, like equilibrium constant expression are changed then the position of equilibrium is not affected that is calcium carbonate solid calcium oxide solid carbon dioxide gas see for this reaction i am writing kc expression kc expression is nothing but what concentration of carbon dioxide because in the equilibrium constant expressions solid components should not be there because active masses of the solid components is equal to 1 now, for this reaction, after the attainment of equilibrium, if ever I add some calcium carbonate, generally if you increase the concentration of reactants, rate of our reaction increases. So, if you add calcium carbonate, position of equilibrium will not be affected because in the KC expression for this, calcium carbonate is not there calcium oxide is not there. So, whether you add calcium carbonate or whether you remove the calcium carbonate or whether you add calcium oxide or remove the calcium oxide, position of equilibrium will not be affected. 
if you change the concentration of carbon dioxide then it will be affected. Now, I am writing K p expression for this. See K p expression for this is the equilibrium constant in terms of pressure is partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Now, listen children. Now, this reaction we are performing yet equilibrium pressure was found to be 2 atmospheres pressure was found to be 2 atmospheres then what is equilibrium constant in terms of partial pressure. Now, in this entire reaction there is only one gaseous component. So, the pressure is due to that component only. So, this is the total pressure and the same is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. So, K p is equal to partial pressure of carbon dioxide because of that equilibrium constant in terms of pressure for this system is equal to total pressure. Is it clear children? Yes. Now, here you may get another question. See, A to B solid giving rise to 2A gas, B gas, this is the reaction. Now, at the equilibrium, total pressure is equal to 6. Now, I want K p, K p is equal to partial pressure of A square into partial pressure of B. Now, what is this 6? 6 is the total pressure. Here, total pressure of which components? A and B. In what ratio this A and B are getting? We are getting A and B in 2 is to 1 ratio. We must distribute the total pressure to 2 is to 1 ratio to A and B. So, partial pressure of A is equal to 2 by 3 into 6 that is a 4 atmosphere and the partial pressure of B is equal to uh, 1 by 3 into 6 that is 2 atmosphere. Then what is the K p value? K p is equal to 4 square into 2. 4 square means 16 into 2 that is 32. Children the most important thing is the units. Here what is the unit? Atmospheric cube is the unit for this reaction. Is it clear children? Okay. Now, delta G naught for a reaction at equilibrium, equilibrium change in the Gibbs free energy is equal to 0. This is not just a change in the Gibbs free energy, change in the standard Gibbs free energy that is equal to minus 2.303 RT log Kc that Kc is nothing but equilibrium constant in terms of the concentration there. Now, see relationship between the degree of disassociation and vapor density. This is the very, very important in many times they asked a question related to this in the previous NEET examinations. Now, let us discuss one question related to that. Now, vapor density of undecomposed N2O4 that is nothing but a theoretical vapor density. How much it is? 46. When heated vapor density decreases to 24.5 due to its disassociation to N2O4 that is N2O4 disassociates to 2NO2 is it clear? Then here alpha is equal to D minus D by D into N minus 1. What is this capital D? It is nothing but a theoretical vapor density. What is small d? Observed vapor density. What is the n? Number of moles of the product formed from one mole of the reactant. One mole of the reactant means if a n will give n, here n is equal to n value. So, there I am writing like this. Alpha is equal to d minus d by d into n minus 1. Here what are they asking? They are asking the percentage disassociation that means they are asking alpha capital D that means a theoretical vapor density how much it is 46 minus uh, observed vapor density 24.5 divided by 24.5. Now, one molecule is giving how many molecules? 2 molecules that is 2 minus 1 that is 46 minus 24.5 by 24.5. If you simplify, you will be getting value closer to 80. Is it clear children? Then, now let us see this question. 
calculate the partial pressure of carbon monoxide from the following data. So, two reactions are given. Now, in the first reaction, out of the three components, two components are solids, one component is the gas. So, partial pressure of that means Kp of for this reaction is equal to partial pressure of carbon dioxide just now only we have discussed. Now, see the second reaction. In the second reaction, reactant side there is a one gaseous component, product side there is a one gaseous component. So, for this reaction Kp is equal to partial pressure of CO square by partial pressure of carbon dioxide. What is the Kp for this reaction? 2. 2. 2 is equal to partial pressure square of carbon monoxide. Then what is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide? 8 into 10 power minus 2. So, 8 into 2 how much? It is 16 into 10 power minus 2 is equal to partial pressure of carbon monoxide square. So, partial pressure of carbon monoxide is equal to under root of this. So, 4 into 10 to the power of minus 1, there is nothing but 0.4. So, what is that 0.4? 0.4 is the degree of disassociation. That means, if you take uh, 1 mole from that 0.4 mole only undergoes disassociation under the given set of conditions. Is it clear children? Next. Now, A to B disassociates to 2A and 3B. Just now only we have discussed it. What is the equilibrium pressure? 6. In what ratio A and B formations are taking place? 2 is to 1. So, partial pressure of A will be the 4, partial pressure of B will be the 2. Then, Kp, partial pressure of A square into partial pressure of B, 4 square into 2, that is 32. 32 uh, atmospheric cube. Here, 32 value is given, that is atmosphere. So, children, these things are the very, very important. You must read the question carefully. You must read the options carefully. You must see the units carefully in the question as well as in the options. Is it clear, children? Yes. Now, see, first that question we have already discussed. Let us see the second question. See, in the system, 2SO2 plus O2 giving rise to 2SO3. 2 moles of sulphur dioxide, 1 mole of oxygen and 2 moles of sulphur, uh, sulphur trioxide are present in equilibrium. Equilibrium means already they are mentioning the number of moles at equilibrium. So, directly we can calculate equilibrium constant. That is Kc is equal to SO3 square by SO2 square O2. So, how many moles of sulphur trioxide? 2. So, 2 square. How many moles of sulphur dioxide? 2. 2 square. How many moles of oxygen? 1. So, Kc is equal to 1 here. Is it clear? Then, now what is the number of moles of oxygen to be introduced into the vessel? That means, we are changing the concentrations of one of the components that will not affect equilibrium constant. Equilibrium constant depends only on the temperature and is independent on that all other things. Then, now I am writing the reaction like this. 2SO2 plus O2 giving rise to 2SO3. At equilibrium, what we have? 2, 1 and 2. What is the condition here? What is the number of moles of oxygen to be introduced? We do not know how many moles of oxygen to be introduced. I am assuming this is x moles. Why? To increase the equilibrium moles of sulphur trioxide to 2. Already how many moles of sulphur trioxide we have? 2. So, how many moles of sulphur trioxide we should get after adding this moles of oxygen? That is 3. So, how many moles of oxygen need to be formed? That is 1. Now, what I am doing is, I am adding x moles of oxygen. I do not know how many moles of oxygen. So, I am assuming that x moles. See, because of addition of x moles, what need to happen? One more mole of sulphur trioxide should be formed. In what ratio they are reacting? 2 is to 1 is to 2. If one mole of sulphur trioxide is formed, how many moles of oxygen need to be consumed? Half of that. There is a minus 0.5. 
for every 2 moles of sulfur trioxide, 2 moles of sulfur dioxide need to be consumed. So, how much it is? Minus 1. So, 2 minus 1, this is equal to 1. This is equal to 1 plus x minus 0.5 and this is equal to 3. So, this is equal to 1, this is equal to x plus 0.5, this is equal to 3. Then Kc is the same formula and same equilibrium constant we need to use because equilibrium constant does not change on changing the concentration. So, 1 is equal to sulphur trioxide whole square 3 square divided by sulphur dioxide square that means 1 square into x plus 0.5 x plus 0.5 is the number of moles of oxygen, the concentration of oxygen will be here. So, that is equal to 9 is equal to x plus 0.5. So, x is equal to how much? 8.5 moles of oxygen. So, if you add 8.5 moles of oxygen at equilibrium, then we will be getting 3 moles of sulphur trioxide. Is that clear children? Now, so this is about the chemical equilibrium in the